This is all flowery language and hot bosoms. <laughs> I cannot stand when a guy leaves me hung red. That's fucked up. Dumbass. Oh my god, girl. Hello, friends. Welcome to the very first episode of Bodice Rivers. I'm your host, the charming coquette. Together, we shall take a journey through the world of romance novels. Now, today is a rainy day, so it's the perfect sort of day to curl up with a good book and a nice mug of tea. There's nothing in this cup. Why is there nothing in this cup? Oh. It's gonna be one of those books. Now, today's book is Devil in the Dark by Evelyn Rogers. Look at that romance. Look at it. He rode out of the Yorkshire mist. A dark figure on a dark horse. Was he a living man? Or a nightmare vision conjured up by her fearful imagination and her uncertain future? Voices swelled in her head. They say he's more than human. A man's life is in danger when he's around. And a woman's virtue. Repelled yet fascinated, Lucinda found herself swept into a whirlwind courtship. Yet even as his lips set fire to her heart, she could not forget his words of warning on the night they met. Tread softly. Heed little that you see and hear, then leave. For God's sake, leave! Whether he was the lover of her dreams or the embodiment of all she feared, she sensed he would always be her. Devil in the dark. Black cape flying, the sharp hooves of his steed flashing ominously in the half-light that fell across the road. So, getting very, it was a dark and stormy night vibes here. And basically, this first meeting, Lucinda is almost run down by her uh, would-be lover. We get the fir our first description of Lucinda with hand pressed to her bosom. She tried in vain to slow her pounding heart. Great heaving breast breaths. Breaths. So he's staring down at her, and we get his gloved hands gripping the reins in masterful control of his steed, as if he controlled her too. Hot. At this point, they're basically just staring at each other, like, in fear and shock and awe, and she notices his cape, she saw, was lined in red. The color of blood. And then we get part of Lucinda's actual personality. How dare this arrogant stranger almost ride her down then gallop away without a hint of concern. To skip and give you a bit of the plot, our character is Lucinda Fairfax, and one of my issues with this book was that Lucinda's actually pretty interesting. Um, she grew up poor in America with a single mother, her father having abandoned them when she was a child uh, after coming into his inheritance in his, um, his land, um, and she never knew whatever happened to him. And then he dies and she gets all this land and his title in um, England, and she doesn't want it. She doesn't want it at all. She has no connection to the land. Um, her habits and customs are strange, having not grown up in, no in nobility. But besides that, there's this great, there's this undercurrent of a story of her kind of coming to grips with uh, her father. And the, and the fact that her father is dead and how he died and feeling like his ghost is still haunting the manor. And she's so logical and straightforward, but every time she's around this, uh, this guy, she's like an emo teenager meeting a vampire. It's, uh, it's irritating is what it is. Housekeeper's opinion is beautiful, which is, the best advice I can give you, if you're of a mind to take such from the likes of me, is to stay off His Grace's property and away from his presence. If you want a long and happy life, I don't know why I gave her that awful accent, but my note there was that I think he's a vampire, and that would explain why Lucinda acts so weird around him. And it's the middle of the night, she decides to go look out at her private gardens, when suddenly she recognized the tall, powerful figure in an instant. The black hair, the black cape with the blood red lining, even the black eyes, though the latter were imagined more than actually perceived. Not imagined, were the harsh lines of his face, the strong features, the air of being absolutely in control. Gideon Blackthorn. 
the devil Duke of Ravenswood, stood a dozen yards away, as forbidding and imposing on foot as he had been in the early morning hour astride his galloping steed. He was not resting in his castle, as she had supposed, or riding wildly about the countryside. He was here with her, the very beginning of a new night, and they were very much alone. He is trespassing! Here's one of my other issues with this. Everyone else speaks very normally, period appropriate, but in a sort of natural way. And every time he opened his mouth, you get stuff like this. Is it the custom in your country to wear your hair loose in such a manner? It is the color of the moonlight, you know, and the mist catches in its strands like beads of crystal. Oh my god. Lucinda means light, does it not? You have come to a dark place in the world. I doubt you truly belong. His gaze returned to hers. Nothing can protect us from ourselves and from our fate. With black cape swirling, he turned from her. <laughs> Get this man a stage, honestly. At least, luckily, Lucinda shares the same sensibilities as me at first. Arrogant Yorkshire dukes, it would seem, had a definite flair for the dramatic, which is a fucking understatement. There's a lot of this that I haven't highlighted because it was all stuff that didn't have to do with Gideon and his weirdness. And she finds out that her father fell off a cliffside on this pathway that he walked many, many times. And all, even though the weather was um, poor conditions that day, she feels there's something suspect about this. So she decides because she's weirded out and thinks that if her father walked this path all the time and he didn't fall, maybe she should go check this place out. Surprise, surprise, who's lurking in the woods watching her? And she says, is something wrong? Nothing, he said in a hoarse whisper that barely carried to her. And everything. So later on, he trespasses in her garden again, and she's all oh, about it. Um, and she's talking, she, but she is kind of weirded out by the events earlier and decides to ask him what the hell that was all about. Of course, I remember everything about you. You looked fragile, standing too near the cliff's edge. I must also remember that it is disturbing for you if I retreat when you are near. You don't like when I walk toward you, and you don't like when I walk away from you. What a puzzling creature you are! I'm like, that's not puzzling. Your, your behavior is odd, and it's making them feel odd and awkward and questioning what your motives are, you freak. Sorry, that was a harsh word. The word I meant to use was, um, you fuck. With a bow, he turned and hurried down the path. Once again, a shadow. And I just, I can't help it. I kind of just imagine him, like, scurrying away. Like, scampering in his cloak with, like, like, like a vampire. Like, da-da-da! And so now Miss Fairfax decides to go to town. Eventually, there she meets Mr. Sheridan, um, Pettifor. And he's kind of shallow, but he's also kind of fun. So, therefore, I kind of like his character. So, Lucinda's also going to, besides meet townspeople and see the town, is going to run errands. Like, finding out stuff about her father's will. If she denied the bequest, all the funds and property would go to the crown. It was not something that she, as an American, was prepared to allow. Which, I guess I can respect. America, fuck yeah. Lucinda um, meets the reverend's wife, who tells her the story of Gideon and his twin brother, Geoffrey. Gideon had a twin brother named Geoffrey. They were very, very close. When they were children, Geoffrey had an accident um, and hit his head very badly and then was never the same after the accident uh, and was prone to violent fits of rage and saying awful, awful things. Um, and eventually, while en route with his father to go see a doctor that could possibly help him manage what was wrong and figure out what was wrong with him, he was lost at sea. Lucinda rides along to Gideon's property just to have a chance encounter with him, of course. And so Lucinda spends a good amount of time ogling him. The front of his shirt caught against the contours of his sweat dampened chest, and she could see the short dark hairs in the opening at his throat. His thighs were strong, his stomach flat, and the sun glinted in the silver buckle at his waist. Um, while they're talking, he's, she seems to get the sense that he's mocking her a little bit. Um, and she calls him on it, and he says, If I am, again the liquid voice, I should be whipped, and you, of course, the one to do the whipping. 
<clears throat> is constantly monologuing about how he makes her feel and uh, how gorgeous he is and how he awakens this primal lust inside of her that she's never felt before. So Lucinda decides to throw a party to kind of welcome herself to the neighborhood. Of course she invites Gideon on the down low even though everyone's like, don't invite him. He sucks at parties. He comes in and like, he starts talking about his history thesis. It's mad boring. Um, she meets Mrs. Rebecca Attenbury, who uh, was a friend of Sheridan's, his, his gossip buddy. Mrs. Atterbury had skin the color of milk, slanted blueberry eyes, lips a cherry red. She also boasted breasts as full as musk melons. <laughs> It was at that moment the door to the salon slammed open, and Gideon strode into the room. Make him stop. Yes, Rebecca Atterbury whispered in a voice that had thickened like clotted cream. He drags her away, he needs to speak to her in private. They start getting it on a little bit. He was around the desk in an instant, his hands gripping her arms, his gaze easing like hot honey from her eyes to her throat, the swell of her breasts, oh my god. He gripped her hard against him. Do you have any concept of the trouble you have aroused? Oh. His lips came down on hers, and this time there was nothing gentle about him. His tongue forced its way inside her and raked the darkness of her mouth. The movement was so completely unexpected, and the resultant thrill she had to cling to his coat sleeves to keep from falling. Still, the muscles in the pit of her stomach tightened, and she felt her breasts begin to swell. But her breasts begin to swell? She touched her tongue to his and sensed a tremor shooting through him. This is madness, he said. This is Sparta, she replied. She did not reply that. Oh, now we get to the middle of my book and uh, there's an offer for a free romance novel. Two free romance novels, which is an $11.48 value. Woo! Choice lines of the Dukes. Lucinda asks, was that thunder in the distance? And he responds, probably. It's a sound I'm used to. Lucinda keeps noticing weird behavior from Gideon. That like she sees him some places and he acts like he doesn't know who she is. Or like he acts like he doesn't see her or he sees her and he just like rides away and never speaks to her. She says, why did you ride away from me last night? And before that two nights ago, I waved to you from my balcony and you did not respond. I don't understand, please explain. So basically he leaves her on red, like a lot. <laughs> They're about to get it on. And he knelt beside her. I must start the fire, he said. You already have, is what she responds. Oh, she said, staring at the taut contours of his body. The sweat-soaked shirt she had once seen on him had given only a hint of what lay beneath. She'd had no idea of his magnificence, no concept of the effect it would have on her. You're driving me insane, he whispered. Good. I wrong you. Then why does everything feel right? So he played her body like the master he was, kneading her buttocks while he kissed her thighs. I just really hate that word. It's one of the most unsexy words to me. I know it's, I know it's technical, but God, I hate it. His hands covered her buttocks and held her against him. Nah. She accuses him of treating her like a child. And he says, a child? No woman has ever made such an accusation. I doubt you can do it now. And because he dared to mention even slightly that he's been with other women, Crying out, she scrambled away and grabbed the blanket, holding it between them like a shield. But it could not protect her from his words. It could not heal her heart. Oh, vain the poor tender heart. So, she's so upset and she's thinking how she needs to leave, but her body had not yet forgotten the intimacies of his touch. They played in her, on and on like a haunting melody. Probably Musette as well, so let's be honest. She says, I'm trying to understand you, but it's like climbing a high wall with broken glass across the top. I'm not worth the trouble. My greatest fear is that you will learn how terrible I truly am. Which all I can think of is every emo boyfriend me or my friends have ever experienced in our lives. Like all those boys that shopped at Hot Topic and wore like striped undershirts with um, a band t-shirt over it and were like, I'm not good for you. My soul reeks. I am darkness and decay, and you are 
light and beautiful and everything that's good in the world. <clears throat> there is a um, fire at her manor that she accidentally starts. She leaves a candle burning after visiting her father's room and just everything goes up in flames. So she starts saying Gideon's. She has the room right next to his, of course. He plans it that way. She starts recovering. She starts visiting the town some more. She makes an awful discovery, finding out that um, the China factory that she inherited employs small children and pays them barely anything, but no one else seems to be concerned about this. They're like, yeah, that's just the way of it. But Gideon's still acting weird, so she decides to follow him one day. And then the thing you never saw coming or maybe you didn't because I didn't give a good enough explanation in this in this video. She follows him to this house where he's arguing with someone and she bursts in and two men, heartbreakingly familiar, face one another in the center of the room, mirror images of each other, dressed the same, hair black, eyes black, both tall and lean, their bodies taut, their strong, gaunt features caught in a moment of rage. Jeffrey's alive! <laughs> I did not see that coming. I saw that coming. Come, come, the brother said. You are not usually so mute, Lucinda. At least you are not when I have come to you in the night. He's not telling the truth. They weren't doing some weird twin switcheroo on her. Jeffrey just says mean things to try to hurt people. They're fighting, they're fighting, and then Jeffrey decides in a split second to end it all and leaps to his death over the same precipice that Lucinda's father fell from. So that takes care of Jeffrey in the four pages that he has been, like literally, 13 pages to show up and then kill himself and resolve his whole, we find out that, you know, it was him who's been riding around the Yorkshire countryside at midnight and making people think that Gideon just, you know, is a weirdo and him who, uh, won't speak when Lucinda sees him and acts weird so that Lucinda doesn't know what's going on and it was he who Lucinda's father saw that confused him and scared him and caused him to fall to his death. Lucinda comes to some um, closure over her father after finding his journal. Of course Gideon, like the perfect knight he apparently has become, fixes all her problems at the china factory and everyone gets a better wage and the kids are going to be set up in an orphanage at her old um, estate because she can move into Blackthorn Hall and marry him when we close on I not only love you but I respect you and I need you all my loyalty and devotion I place in your hands I know you will guard them well you are dearest Gideon the best man I have ever known the end it's just that's just that's just so sweet you guys like I love them I don't love them I hope you enjoyed this book. I don't know what book I'll be reading next time. It'll be quite a surprise for all of us, really.